hope. Hope is uh, something that somehow or another has gotten intermingled with faith. I'm not sure that we've distinguished the purpose or the definition of those two words. And in so doing, perhaps we've limited ourselves in a way on accessing something that God has for us, which is namely that hope. Uh, we're gonna look today at Romans chapter eight, verse 22 to 25, 22 to 25. And hopes that we'll be better equipped when we leave here of living beyond ourselves. Who wants to live within their own abilities and their own dreams and their own aspirations? Should we not want to live beyond ourselves with the help of God? Certainly so, and to live with great hope. This series is entitled, I've Not Forgotten You, and this message is entitled, We Hope and We Wait. What was the mindset of the first century believer, Jewish believer? What were they thinking? What were they feeling? What were they doing? What were they expecting? What were they believing? Uh, as it pertained to this Messiah. Certainly they had had many prophecies and, and promises embedded into their identity and their, their heritage, the oral uh, word, the spoken word, the, the written word, the Old Testament prophecies. Surely they knew something was going to happen. They expected something to happen at some point in time. What did they hope for? And what was their situation? What was their cultural moment? What were they experiencing and what were they feeling? I found this letter written in 1960 that I have a feeling isn't that far away from the mindset of the first century Jew under Roman oppression. I think there are some similarities. I think there are some parallels. I think there are some things that we can, I can read to you right now that actually highlight the fact that the 1960s in the United States may not have been all that different than the first century Jew in Palestine under Roman oppression. It looks like this. In 1960, Martin Luther King wrote a letter while in jail in Birmingham, a former president of the Southern Baptist Convention. He wrote this letter to the church leaders at the time. He says, we have waited for more than 340 years for our constitutional and God-given rights. The nations of Asia and Africa are moving with jet-like speed toward gaining political independence, but we still creep at a horse and buggy pace towards gaining a cup of coffee at a lunch counter. Perhaps it is easy for those who have never felt the stinging darts of segregation to say, wait, but when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at a whim, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, and even kill your black brothers and sisters, when you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old six daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park that had just been advertised on television, and see tears welling up in her eyes when she is told that Funtown is closed to colored children, and see ominous clouds of inferiority beginning to form in her little mental sky, and see her beginning to distort her personality by developing an unconscious bitterness towards white people. When you have to concoct an answer for a five-year-old son who is asking, Daddy, why don't white people treat colored people, why do they treat them so mean? And when you take a cross-country drive and find it necessary to sleep night after night in the uncomfortable corners of your automobile because no motel will accept you. When you are humiliated day in and day out by nagging signs reading white and colored, when your middle name becomes boy, however old you are, and your last name becomes John, and your day and haunted by night, haunted day and night by the fact that you're a Negro, living constantly at tiptoe stance, never quite knowing what to expect next, and are plagued with inner fears and outer resentments, when you are forever fighting a degenerating sense of no, nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. There comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over and men no longer are willing to be plunged into the abyss of despair. Racism 
in our culture is probably the, lost, the last remaining stronghold in a generation that had been fed and constantly fed racism as an adoptive way of life. It's probably the last remaining frontier in the process of discipleship and sanctification for many who since childhood have been poisoned by racism. But that's for another day. The point is, Rome and the Jews weren't all that different than what I just read to you. There were many similarities. Yes, there was religious freedom, but they were grossly oppressed. There was great prejudice. There was certainly a great deal of oppression. And there was, in the midst of that oppressiveness, a desire for something better, a longing for and a hope for a coming of the Messiah. The first Christmas season was steeped in an expectation of something dazzling, liberating. Yes, they may have expected a deliverer on a national level, on a political level, but nonetheless, God had promised them, God had prophesied, and God had told them that this would happen, and they hoped, and they waited. In their, in their darkness, in their aloneness, in, at times, their nobodiness, they waited for the coming Messiah knowing that he would actually come to Bethlehem. They were overtaxed, wronged, and probably feeling a bit forgotten. Had God forgotten them? Do you ever feel in your own life, maybe momentarily, if not seasons of your life, that somehow maybe God has forgotten you? God has promised, God has told you, God has encouraged you with certain things, God has fed you certain things, nurtured you in certain ways, gifted you in certain ways, but the opportunity is yet to come. And you feel somehow forgotten. Or you've lost a loved one, one that you thought you'd go through your entire life with, and now you find yourself in a new season, readjusting, acclimating to something totally different. And your future doesn't turn out as though you thought it would and you're living a life you didn't think you would live, and you're asking yourself the question, has God in some way forgotten me? Has he omitted mentioning me? Has he leave, left me unnoticed? Is he thinking of me? Is he sensitive to what I and my plight is in life? And we come to, in the middle of all of that, Romans 8, 22. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. What is childbirth? Well, my understanding of it is, from a distance, that it's somewhat painful. <laughs> Picked up on that. I remember when we went to the couples class and learned the breathing techniques. And I thought, I gotta make sure I get the sequence right. Is the quick paced breathing before the bigger breaths or is the bigger breaths first? And it didn't really matter because once we got into it, I was told, get out of here. <laughs> and something took over. And suddenly I didn't have to remember anything anymore. It was irrelevant. It didn't matter the pace, the sequence, it just, it was done. But I, I'm totally aware of the fact that giving birth is painful. But I also know that the pain precedes an incredible euphoric, <laughs> indescribable bliss. And in a way, that's what our creation is going through, and that's what you and I as created people are going through, and that's what our culture is going through, because we all are enduring a painful process of being fallen and less than and shattered and broken and in despair. Maybe it's momentary at times, but there's a latent underlying uneasiness that exists in culture, in the institutions of our culture, media, government, education, entertainment, family, church. There's an uneasiness beneath the surface. I liken it to your stomach growling. You can't make your stomach growl. It kind of just does it. And why does it do it? It does it because it's longing for something that it wants and it's hoping that it gets it, and it's enduring this growling phase prior to this euphoric bliss of downloading some sort of cupcake 
or barbecue sandwich that seems to make everything okay. Well, our stomachs are growling in this country. We have an uneasiness and creation is groaning. The very globe, the sphere, the oceans, the mountains, the atmosphere is groaning in its fallen state, in its less than pristine condition. All that God created is just longing for something where it's whole again, it's right again, it's clean again. I've traveled to parts of Asia and Southeast Asia where I've, I've spent a week to 10 days there and, I, and, and, I, and in a way I'm glad to be there in a way I want to get out of Dodge because you have to wear a mask where the pollution is so thick and you know the, the actual life expectancy is dropping by the day and people are inhaling smog that seems to just ever present be there and you just know it's groaning, it's groaning, it's groaning. This whole nation, this whole geopolitical thing, it's all groaning as in the pains of childbirth. The pain is being endured in culture and in creation prior to the advent of the blissfulness and the euphoria of the blessed hope Christ's return. Hallelujah. Verse 23, not only so, but we ourselves who, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption to sonship. Let's, let's be honest, you go to a Bible study, you come to a worship service, you listen to a podcast, you, you're reading a blog, there's some, some level of truth being explained or exposed or revealed to you or you're, you're taking it in and guess what? Whether you realize it or not, whether you're aware of it or not, your, your spirit's growling and hungry for something and, and you really want the uneasiness, the awkwardness to dissipate. You're here this morning on some level, whether you realize it or not, to hear something that's gonna calm that lack of satisfaction that you have. And we work hard to bury it, rationalize it, subdue it, suppress it, throw it out in the backyard, and we fill it with all kinds of things. We medicate, alcohol, drugs, relationships, you know what, all the things you hear about. We do all of that to fill that empty stomach, but we're groaning. Though we are the first fruits of the Spirit, in the process of sanctification, we're not yet there. We're not yet fulfilled. Disputes and factions and caucuses and parties and political parties, it's just the disparity, the polarity, the citizens, the mindset, the generational differences, the gender differences, the, our lack of understanding of what our gender is or what we want it to be is all an outward groaning of an inward uneasiness that is a result of the fall of all of mankind and all of creation. There's an unsettledness in us, a restlessness, a conscious tiptoeing around certain subjects and social circles so as not to of us tiptoeing around conversations on the Thanksgiving dinner table or the holiday meal, a, a, a casualness that we put aside for a sensitivity to certain issues and, and the possibility that they have to erupt and all of everybody's emptiness to come out and disparity and, and, and uneasiness to come out and just verbalize it. It's the truth. We're not only so, but we ourselves, having been the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly. We're going through a painful process for the redemption of our bodies. Man, are you physically falling apart like I am? <laughs> I mean, come on. 20 minutes to get to where I can walk around, limber up a little bit, get the game, get my game face on. I need a devotion before my devotion. We've got every string of Christmas lights in Macon County in our living room. I get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. It's like I walked into the airport and there's a coming down the runway. <laughs> it's like, ah. Uh. But we, we long for the redemption of our bodies. Gosh, this is good news, isn't it? In the afterlife, in eternal life, this will be up here where it used to be. <laughs> Glorified bodies, wholeness, man, lack of stomach growling, satisfaction. That's what we hope for, that's what we long for. 
For in this hope we were saved. There's the word hope. For in this hope we were saved. I thought you were saved by faith, which you are. What's the difference between faith and hope? They're so close to one another. Huh? They're almost interchangeable. I don't think they're supposed to be, but they're almost interchangeable. What is, what is faith? Faith is, is saying that God can and will do taking him at his word. The belief and the evidence of things not yet seen. Faith is the trust God at his word. There you go. Now, that could be on a continuum from a mustard seed of faith to uh, no greater faith as I, have I seen in all of Israel. Somewhere between A and Z, you'll find yourself, whether it's F or L or S or U, I don't know. But you have, if, you do, if you follow Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you have a faith in the word that he has spoken, and you have received it by faith, and you are saved. Your sin is forgiven, you have a Lord of your life, and you have eternal life. You confess your sins, you repent of them, you ask them to come inhabit your heart, and you're saved, you're bought, you're ransomed. Faith did all of that. Well, it could have been a mustard seed of faith, or it could have been a faith greater than all that you've seen in all of Israel. But either way, you just flat out born again. Faith. Now, hope is different. It's the expectation of that faith coming to pass. But, but hope and joy are, are always hanging out together. They travel the same road. Hope is a joyful expectation of what it is we believe coming to pass. I like that. In fact, if you look at the words for Advent, hope, peace, joy, and love, now listen to this verse. How important is this verse? Romans 15 and 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, and may you overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. A great memory verse for this Christmas time, Romans 15, 13. Every one of you should memorize that verse and live it. And a God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, and may you overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So we find that hope now is, um, is hangs out with joy. And we're to overflow with these two things as we trust God, as we believe in him by faith. And it comes by way of the Spirit. Do you have hope? Say a child, how does a child feel? A, a, feel, a child feels great joy when his father tells him they're going to an amusement park in the morning. Yeah, that's cool. The child believes that he will go to the park based on his father's words, faith. At the same time, that belief in the child kindles an Ir irrepressible joy that is hope. He believes he's going to the amusement park in the morning, but the joy, the itchiness, the giddiness of waiting for that expectation to come about, like Christmas morning, is hope. The child's natural trust in his father's promise is the faith. The child squeals at delight and jumping in place are the expressions of hope, joyful expectation. Hope is the great eddy in the uh, tumultuous rapids of life. You ever gone down a river and there's like class five rapids and you act like you're not afraid but you're scared to death, but you got some guide on the back, you're clutching onto the raft. They, they just scared you to death telling you how many times you could die and what you have to do when you go down this fast thing and drop what looks like 100 feet, it's really 10. That's, that takes faith. Hope is the joyous expectation you're gonna make it down the river as you sit in the pristine and serene eddy on the side of the river. That's hope. It's believe, not believing you're gonna make it, but enjoying the fact you're in the water and it's gonna happen. They're distinct, but they're also related. 1 Corinthians 13 and 13, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Faith is different than hope and necessary, but for some reason, it gets pushed to the backyard when it comes to that, that trio, faith, hope, and love. Love is big, faith is way bigger to many, and hope just seems to tag along. Do you have hope? I'll tell you why this is important. Paul goes on to say, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. 
And I think this is why we get confused with faith. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, for the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. Faith is the evidence of things not yet seen, and, and hope is the fact that that which you believe is going to come to pass and eagerly awaiting it with joy. All right, there you go. Now, what's the difference between faith and hope in everyday life? Well, let me tell you. Just this week, I dealt on various levels with three, three deaths. Some closer than others, but three deaths. Three people associated with this church lost a loved one at various levels of intensity. In addition to all of that, even, even dealt with one who sought to bring about their own death. It's quite a week. Faith is important, but it is not enough. Why would one want to end their own life? Which, by the way, is becoming more and more common on this mountain. Well, you can have faith, and I've met many who have faith, who no longer wanted to live. Why is that? The faith was there to believe that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior. Faith to believe that they're going to heaven. But the absence of hope, the absence of a joyful expectation that would come to pass left them with faith, but hopeless. And when we find ourselves hopeless and we're told only to increase our faith, we find ourselves in a very difficult spot. If only we had more faith, when in reality, we didn't need more faith, we actually needed more hope more of a joyful, not a sad, not a laborious, not a heavy, not an oppressive, not a legalistic, more of a joyful waiting and expectation. We ask for faith to believe in healing and we pray, faith to believe in deliverance and we pray and we pray and we pray and we pray and we pray. And, we pray. and our antidote to the prayer not yet being answered is to come back with more and more prayer, more and more prayer, more and more requests. We pass the persistent widow so far down the line that as if God had forgotten to listen to us or God had forgotten what we had said to him over 500 times, it's not that we needed more faith. It's that we needed to take our spiritual transmission and change gears into, he has heard, I believe, I have let go of it, I have surrendered, I'm now going to sh sh clutch, move forward with hope. And we miss this. Faith, hope, and love has turned out to be faith and love. If I have enough faith, you'll love me. If I love you enough, I'll get enough faith. If I get enough faith, I can turn it in for something that I want, like it's some sort of gift card. No, my friend, we believe, we trust, we surrender, we relinquish, and then we hope. And we hope joyously. And we hope with expectation. God has already said you're going to be healed. After a while, you kind of have to leave him alone about it. And you have to move on to hope, which he, is part of the purpose of the trial, my friend, is not only to have your faith increase, but your hope to actually exist. Hope. The world is in need of more people going through a trial who have an inexpressible, unexplainable joy as they wait on that which they believe God will do in their life, joyously. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. That was actually good preaching right there. <laughs> that was actually. Everything before that was average. That right there was a take home. 
and I give the Lord credit for that. <laughs> if, if, if we only had more faith, how's that working out for you? Have you quantified that? Have you somehow, like, a bell go off or something on your phone? You have a phone app for that? When my faith has been increased to the level I think it needs to be increased, I should be getting some sort of thing on my phone app to let me know that I now can pray for certain things. Well, that explains the absence of prayer in the church, doesn't it? Hope. God's placed you in a place, sometimes a physical one, sometimes an emotional one, sometimes a spiritual one. And you need faith before you get in it and when you're in it, and you need faith to get out. But if he's at work in your life, and he's the Lord of your life, and he's ordaining your steps, and he's laying out a plan that he has for you and has declared to you, a plan to give you a hope and a future, can we trust that as that process begins, we need to have a joyous expectation as we walk behind him, not in front of him, that he's gonna bring it to pass? Seems like that makes sense to me. Hope. Israel and the religious elite, the rabbis, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Messiah came and they had great faith. They didn't have a whole lot of hope and a not a lot of joy. And somehow or another they cast love aside and it was just a small kid who got born in Bethlehem and he wasn't the savior of the world. Though they had been told, though they had been prophesied, though the promises had been confirmed, though the place, the time, and everything else and the fullness of time came to pass, they had a deep faith, but they had no love, no way of realizing love, and I don't know where the joy was. I don't see a whole lot of hope. I see a whole lot of control on who wanted to be in charge. Who hopes for what they already have, Paul says. Who hopes for what they already have? More and more, I'm sensitive to, and, and, and I'm not, believe me, no, no one's gonna pray in front of me anymore because I say this. This is, I should not say this. But I'm gonna say it anyway. <laughs> we pray for things we already have. Meaning, we take up time, energy, focus, on not praying for things we don't yet have. We pray for God to be with us. He is. <laughs> Don't do that, okay? We pray for, I don't think we understand what we have in a spiritual sense. I, I, I come under spiritual attack, you know, from time to time. And I'm aware of it. But I, I cannot lose awareness of what I do in those situations. Okay, I know who to call, I know who to have prayer, I know what to do. It happens, you know, more than I care to admit, but it happens. Now, do you understand what you have at your disposal? Let's say you're a prison guard. How'd you like to make a living being a prison guard? Do we have a prison guard here today? Wow, what a way to make a buck. Let's say you're a prison guard and a, and a riot breaks out in your cell block. Oh, that's crazy. For $14 an hour. So what do you do? You get on the walkie-talkie and you call for your buddies to come and help you. Well, you're, you're a prison guard in the kingdom of God. And you come under attack and some disruption comes your way and it's a spiritual oppression. You can call your buddies to come to your aid, just like the prison guard. Oh, but the prison guard not only has his buddies, he has a whole SWAT team that exists on the prison with an arsenal they can unlock to come to your cell block and help you. But it's not only that, the warden can get on the phone at your request and he can get the local police and the state police to come down there. And the North Carolina Bureau of Investigation, if that's not enough, we have the National Guard, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, Marines, and the Coast Guard, and our NATO allies. In a spiritual sense, there isn't an angel there isn't an angel that's not accessible to you by way of asking for help. See, we, we pray not for the oppression, but we don't pray to access what we already have in the middle of it. You see, hope. 
Who hopes for what they already have? Don't hope for something you already have. But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. If I was gonna take one word and erase it from the Bible, wouldn't yours be patiently? What, the, what is that? It's gotta be some sort of Greek misprint. Patiently? Patience, does that still exist? I guess people are patient. You ever met anybody that's patient? And the, well, I should qualify. In the last 10 years, have you ever met anybody who's patient? It's crazy, isn't it? I know, I'll hurry up and finish. <laughs> Patiently. Let's wait for it. That's a good phrase. We do that. Wait for it. Wait for it. Wait for it. But we don't have the keyword patiently. Hmm. I don't know where you're at. And I don't know if you're oppressed. I don't know if you're wrong, improperly judged. I don't know if there's a bias against you. I don't know if you've been betrayed. I don't know if you can identify with the people in the 60s or first century Israel. I don't know. But I do know this. You need a little bit of faith that lends itself to foster a whole lot of hope. And the hope has a joy attached to it because you've already trusted the one who's going to help you. And now you get to participate in the process of joyfully and patiently waiting. And that means you get to see him show off. And when will he show off? And when will he set you free? When the adequate amount of people in your situation have got the attention of God so that when he delivers you, others take note as well. He's very efficient in that way. When he gets done teaching you what you need to learn and I need to learn. When he instills in us a hope and we overflow with hope. You see, the world is full of people that go through trials, but rare, and even rarer, is the, are those who go through trials with an element of joy. What would the witness be of the body of Christ oozing hope and joy in the midst of despair? Knowing that their faith and their request and their prayer has been heard, don't be anxious for anything, but in everything, with prayer and petition, present your request to God. Oh, and the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus as you joyfully, expectantly, with confidence, trust and hope in what it was you just settled with God in accordance with his will in prayer. Not more prayer, more prayer, more prayer. Prayer, 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 hope. Far less burnout, far less repetition, far less religious exercises, far more trust, far more relationship, far more smiles, far more liberty, far more intimacy with Christ. Hope. Hope. There are those people of faith who are hurting themselves cutting themselves, hurting themselves. And it's not necessarily for the absence of faith. It's for a hope vacuum that exists in a person's life. You want to minister to someone in your life today? Tell them a little bit about faith, but tell them a whole lot about hope. There's a destiny out there for people. There's a plan. There are steps, there are victories, there are milestones, there are accomplishments, there are fruitful things. In this life, oh, and while we're at it, let's not miss out on the blessed hope, the second coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to this earth. Do we live in expect, joyful expectation of that reality? Because if we do, then we also steward the limited time we might have. Are you maximizing the time you have on this earth in a faith that God will use you, in a hope, a joyous hope, that you will dispense this overflowing hope to other people?
We are, in this nation, losing not faith alone, but hope. And when we get to the place where we have a faith, as distorted and as spread abroad as it is in various circles, in untrue ways, in unreligious ways, in false religious ways, we'll always have a faith in ourselves in this country. But when you introduce hope, eventually we realize our faith in ourselves brings no joy, yields no results fleeting and temporary at best. This is heavy on my heart today. You came to this service and you're thinking to yourself, I just need more faith. And I wanna remind you of something. You may not be aware of how much you loved and how much Christ cherishes you how much the Spirit of God wants to lead you and settle in you. Not a growling, groaning, but a satisfaction and a trust. And you're in a process that he's already started and he will carry it on to completion unto the day of Christ Jesus. Don't try to increase your faith to the point where you miss the enjoyment of the transformation. Seize the hope and watch him show off as you joyfully expect him to do something each and every day in your life based on what you trusted and surrendered to his care. And watch yourself set free. Watch yourself mature. Watch yourself grow. Watch yourself become more loving and more lovable. Wiser, a better counselor, a more seasoned, loving, caring, hope-filled person. Let's pray. If you're here this morning and you've never received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, oh, my friend, please hear me. Please, please hear me. This is not an indictment on you. It's true of all of us. You have not what it takes in and of yourself to live a life worthy of heaven. You don't now, and you never will. You are in need, as we all are, to live beyond yourself, not where the yoke is heavy, but where the burden is light, not where you must be strong and disciplined, but where you can be weak, and he is your strength, where you can falter, and he will pick you up where his grace is sufficient. Listen to me. You've been brought here at this moment to hear the following words. Thank you for believing. Can we trust? Will you surrender? May I walk you into your destiny with joy and purpose. He loves you just the way you are and died for you when you were even worse. And there's nothing you can do to cause him to love you more and nothing you'll ever do to cause him to love you less. There's a whole bright future out there for you that's steeped in joy and lightheartedness. You're going to the amusement park. Enjoy the adventure. Some of you have lost the innocence of a little child and you need that back. You need the frivolity and the laughter and the innocence of a little kid on a summer vacation. And life has brought you serious consequences. And it's really time to take a break and relinquish yourself to a joyous, patient hope in the King of every King and the Lord of every Lord. Jesus Christ. It's time. It's past time. On this first Sunday of Advent, if 
if you want your adventure to begin in Christ, full of faith and hope and love, you need to receive him to invite him into your heart. I'm going to pray a prayer. You pray along with me. If you mean it, you mean it. And if you don't, you don't. It's not time yet. It goes like this. Father, I want to come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. I accept his death as a punishment for my sin. And I wish to no longer beat myself up. I wish, Lord, to acknowledge his burial, and I ask you that I might too die to self and become new in Christ. I also acknowledge and believe in his resurrection from the dead, that Lord, I too may one day receive eternal life in heaven. I don't know that I've ever done anything to deserve what you've done for me. But I got enough faith to believe this morning that I can receive it, that I can be beautiful in my own eyes again, and that I can stop being my own worst enemy, and I can live with a joy and a peace, hope, probably, Lord, for the first time. I confess my sin, and I ask you to forgive me. Raise me up to be new, new creation in you. I want to put on Christ. I come to you by faith. Receive me as I am, just as I am. Please do this for me. In Jesus' name, my new Lord and my Savior, the strong and merciful Son of God. Amen.